I'm assuming now that you, the researcher, have decided what field you're going to work within. You selected a topic and you know how to justify that topic. You've been reading other researchers, you've been reading theories, and that enables you to develop a basic model of the part of uh, reality you want to investigate, so you know sort of what you want to discover and how you're going to get there. And an essential feature now for some methodologies is the development of a hypothesis, and I want to talk now about hypothesis development, how that's done. First, I should preface this with a note. Uh, people ask, uh, do you need to have hypotheses to do research? Uh, the quick answer is no, it's not necessary. Uh, people can do exploratory research, uh, go out into a field and uh, turn over stones and see what they discover uh, without having any formal rigid hypotheses. However, um, particularly that would be in qualitative research, uh, my own feeling is that the use of hypotheses gives you intellectual stability. It makes you think quite radically. What am I trying to do? Uh, how am I going to get there? How will I know when I've got there? Uh, how can I explain to my spouse or to my children or to my parents what it is that I'm doing, for example? Hypotheses uh, are ultimately part of the way in which we formalize research and communicate it. Should add, not just to your family, but also if you're applying for funding, for example, a few good hypotheses are useful. Good. What is a hypothesis? Firstly, it's a statement. A simple statement. It's not a question, it's not a perhaps, it's not maybe. It's a simple statement, usually with no modal verbs. Uh, the earth is round. Simple statement. Uh, this statement should relate variables. And what are variables? Uh, anything that varies. Okay, Different possible shapes for the earth. Those would be a set of variables. Uh, the earth is one of many planets, so the planets would be a list of variables. For Chesterman, and I, I don't just want to give you my idea of hy a hypothesis here, uh, Chesterman says a hypothesis is an educated guess at the best answer to a question based on the most reliable facts available. Um, so Chesterman is thinking that the hypothesis should be the best des description we can have of reality. Uh, personally, I don't care. Uh, the hypothesis can be interesting uh, without being the most exact, accurate description. Um, hypotheses can prove very productive when they fail and give way to alternative hypotheses, for example. So I would uh, emphasize the interest of the hypothesis rather than its accuracy, but that's two people talking about the way hypotheses can work. Also, uh, Andrew Chesterman has this list of different kinds of hypotheses, and you can go to his work and find that. He recognizes there are descriptive hypotheses, explanatory, predictive. And I think they're all fine. Um, I disagree, as I mentioned when talking about models, on the topic of interpretive hypotheses, here where X, the thing we're studying, can be interpreted as. Uh, I don't think that is, properly speaking, a hypothesis. Hypotheses should not have modals. The can is a modal here. Um, and that I would classify as a model. It's, it's, it's like a, a pigs can fly hypothesis. You can say pigs can fly. All right, is that a good hypothesis? Well, I don't know. If you look at lots of pigs and you see they don't fly, perhaps not. But they can fly if you push them hard enough and fast enough from the top of a very tall building, they will fly for a very short way. Uh, so, should the can be in the hypothesis? I suspect not. For me, a good hypothesis has to meet these points. First, it should be clear and positive. Uh, pigs can fly is better than pigs cannot fly. But I would prefer to say 
all pigs do fly. Or then do not fly. A good hypothesis should be elegant. This means if there are two hypotheses, and one has five terms and the other has three terms, we prefer the one that has three terms. It comes from the basic idea that, that a scientific statement about the world should have fewer variables than there are in the world. Elegance is a criteria. A good hypothesis for me can be tested. That is, we can go out with this positive statement and see if it is true or false in a certain number of environments. If it can't be tested, it's not a worthwhile hypothesis. And finally, it can be generalized. That means it's not just pertinent to the observation of one particular pig flying from one particular building. We should be able to operate in such a way as we could talk about all pigs pushed from the top of all buildings of a certain height. Uh, sorry, the final point is it should, for me, be falsifiable as far as possible. Here I follow the thinking of Karl Popper. Um, falsifiable means that we can test it and find it to be untrue. If we have hypotheses which cannot be untrue, uh, they're not interesting. Um, I think one of Popper's examples um, makes fun of Freud, for example, where Freud says that every son wants to kill their father. Uh, so if the son admits this, the hypothesis is true. If the son does not admit this, uh, then we are repressing the truth. So any evidence that comes out, uh, none of this evidence can falsify the hypothesis. Does that make Freud's idea uninteresting? Not at all. It's a very, very productive model. But it's not a, a good scientific hypothesis as far as I'm concerned. Let's just look at some examples of simple hypotheses. Here's one. It says, I take this from an old Spanish textbook. Okay. Bad teachers should be expelled because they are re the reason for the low standards of universities. Good hypothesis. Interesting idea. However, um, should is a modal. And for that reason, uh, we should not accept it as a hypothesis, I feel. Also, the low standards of universities might be attributed to many factors, such as the bad pay of teachers, the bad working conditions, the bad level of the students, and so on. Second hypothesis. There are no social inequalities between Martians. Hmm. Could be true. However, it is untestable, therefore unfalsifiable. Third hypothesis. The idiosyncratic typology of agricultural maintenance operators is an irrational product of the combined action of social and cultural well, amalgams. Good hypothesis? Well, who could tell? Uh, I think it means that farmers are silly because of where they live. I don't know what it means. Uh, the hypothesis is pure jargon. It is unclear and should not be presented as a scientific hypothesis because of that reason. Next hypothesis. If a Spanish family lives in Lapland, it will be highly integrated. Okay, there are many problems. I, I, the main problem is that I suspect there might be one or two Spanish families in Lapland and uh, it would be virtually impossible to generalize that hypothesis. Uh, also, we have to say integrated into what? Uh, we have to make that term operational. But uh, as it is, it suffers from lack of testability and lack of generalizability. Next hypothesis. This is from basic sociology. The higher the degree of urbanization in a region, that is, the more people live in towns and cities, the lower the birth rate, the fewer children they have. Ah, 
I, I guess it's saying that people who live in the countryside have more children than the people who live in cities. That's interesting. It's also interesting because it might be true, but we're not sure. Uh, it's testable. We can get statistics on urbanization. We can get statistics on birth rate. That's not a problem. Uh, and it is interesting. It doesn't present a cause or effect. It doesn't say that urbanization causes the lower birth rate. There might be many other factors involved. This is where we need modeling to come in. But in itself, I think it is a good, interesting hypothesis to pursue. Notice that the hypotheses are things you work with until you develop a new hypothesis, and then you work with that, and then a new one. It's not the end of your research, it's the beginning. Another example. A one-off translator certification examination uh, may not function as an effective signal. This is from uh, real research within our doctoral program on uh, how uh, translators are certified in different countries. Good hypothesis? Not really, because may is a modal. Uh, it is possible that it may not function. To make it a good hypothesis, we would have to say, does not function, and then we would have to say what is meant by an effective signal. Uh, however, uh, it might, you might say, one-off translator certification is less effective as a signal than is ongoing assessment on dossier, for example, an alternative. However, we could fix it up as it stands. It's not particularly edifying. Here are further hypotheses from work that our students have done. Participants, these are participants in an experiment, Participants from countries with a policy of dubbing foreign programs on television will react less favorably to subtitle programs. Fair enough, but less favorably than what? Then you get the next hypothesis. Participants coming from countries with a policy of another will react more favorably. And this is presented as two hypotheses. No, that's silly. Just have one hypothesis with the variables. People from countries where films are dubbed react more favorably to subtitling than do people from countries where films are not dubbed. Then it's interesting, then it's one hypothesis. Further hypothesis from the same research. Portuguese language DVD soundtrack material, material with Portuguese language subtitles, right, will affect students' listening and reading comprehension positively. All right, but we have to say more positive than what? Okay, um, I, didn't, I wouldn't think that it's going to make their comprehension worse, uh, but uh, they might be better off reading books in Portuguese than looking at the DVDs. Uh, again, this is called operationalizing. We take what's there and spell out what we mean by positively. And the hypothesis should not really leave such obvious gaps. Here's a, an interesting hypothesis. A holistic approach to translation technology and practical translation courses, or a certain way of teaching, will strengthen students' per perception of the interrelatedness of these areas of study this, in turn, will lead to more effective and high-quality learning. Well, um, all right. It's a predictive hypothesis because we have will, but uh, we have evaluative terms which shouldn't be there, like strengthen, okay? More effective, high-quality. These evaluations have to be put in terms that can be measured rather than just assumed. Strengthen more than what? Uh, what do we mean by more effective? More effective than what? High quality? Higher quality than what? Um, as it is, it's more like uh, a desire or a belief than a hypothesis that can be tested. 
and this is the next hypothesis from the same research, a stronger perception of the interrelatedness of these areas of study will lead to students' higher levels of awareness and understanding of the links between these areas and their learning processes. This, in turn, will lead to all wonderful things. Here, the problem, in addition to the others, is that it's a tautology. They're saying... Uh, if students see the interrelatedness of area studies, that's the input, they will understand the links between these areas of study. Um, if they see A, they will understand A. Uh, uh, yeah, all right. Uh, the hypothesis is a lot of words taking us nowhere. And here... Uh, uh, <laughs> Hypothesis number six. Uh, this is this is why I'm doing the video because I'm sick of getting these so-called hypotheses. In most instances, the effect of translation of VHE, i.e., VHE in the source language SL, remains VHE in the target language TL. We've evolved a kind of equivalent of TL. All right, it's jargon. It's not the hypothesis has to be a simple, elegant statement that can be tested. This is a description of what you hope to achieve. Ah, number seven. Due to the change in Japan's position in the world during the 18-year period between 1986 and 2004, there will be changes in the type and amount of explicitation used in the translations. Specifically, we can expect that less explicitation will be used since more Japanese cultural references will be familiar to Western readers. Yeah, okay, but the hypothesis should be a statement. They should say, for example, in 2004, there is less explicitation in the translations than in 1986. Test that, and then you would formulate another hypothesis or series of them to try to guess the cause. Okay, uh, you, it's, it's legitimate to have one hypothesis with the two elements, hypothesizing what the relationship will be, but then you cannot assume that if that's true, you know the cause. Remember the, the, the brown paper box? Uh, we might have many possible causes, and that should be the work of another hypothesis or set of hypotheses. Let me move on now. I, I've mentioned some of the problems. In some of the hypotheses, we've seen that the terms are not clear in themselves or they are, they're evaluative and they have to be developed and made operational. Making the hypothesis operational means defining all the terms, particularly those that mean high quality, low quality, better, faster, etc. And uh, in, in doing the operationalizing, uh, which is not in the hypothesis, it comes after when you explain how you're setting up your methodology, you should state your success conditions. That is, at which point would you consider your hypothesis to be justified about uh, more productive or stronger or higher quality? How much higher quality do you need in order to be higher quality uh, for your hypothesis? And at this stage, you can return to your model and try to draw up uh, on the basis of the hypotheses the relations that you expect to discover b between the variables. That is, when you do the hypotheses, you do rely on a certain amount of modeling, and you may have to return and redo your models as you develop the hypotheses. Good hypotheses have a limited number of variables. The more variables there are, the, the, the harder it is to control what you're doing, the harder it is to say anything about causation. Um, if you're setting up an experiment especially, you should try to make sure that only one of the variables is changing. Remember when I was putting in different qualities of water, and that the others stay the same. I used the same box. If you're doing this observationally, that is, you're not intervening, you're not doing an experiment, you're looking at the world and comparing brown paper boxes, uh, you should try to compare cases where only one variable is different as far as possible. That is, um, 
perhaps you're talking about the effect of a country having a, a, an international language like English, you might want to pick, instead of comparing the United States with Spain, a very big country with a not so big country, uh, you might want to compare Canada with Spain um, because uh, the similarities are greater and the presence of the English language will be more significant as a different variable. Okay, so you select your procedure in order to try to isolate as far as possible the variable you're most interested in testing. Those things, however, depend very much on the kind of project you're involved in. Uh, as far as hypotheses go, I think I can just present these broad outlines and, and firmly recommend that you try to envisage uh, what your hypothesis is going to be, you write it down, you stick with it as far as you can, and then you only change it um, when you feel you have a better hypothesis to move to. Usually in your research, there should just be one major hypothesis. That is, you're going to really discover just one thing. Uh, this will incur a series of minor hypotheses, and that can become interesting and perhaps even eventually more interesting than your main hypothesis. But my, my point here is that to keep yourself on track as a measure of intellectual discipline, if nothing else, you do need to work on and develop at least one good, interesting hypothesis.